Welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Scott McCready, CEO of SoulCyber, managed services, managed security services company. Welcome, Scott. Christian, thanks for having me. This is a, a great topic, as we were just chat, chatting about before. There's a lot that's happening in this space. The topic is demystifying cybersecurity for the modern workplace. But why don't we start out with, tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your company. Sure. The um, I, engineer by trade, I, I probably follow a similar pattern for a lot of people, uh, was responsible for security infrastructure. Um, I don't want to date myself, but back in the early days when security was just sort of being uh, put uh, into networks. And from there, we realized we didn't know what to do with the data. So you had these firewalls and these IDSs, intrusion detection systems, and we're like, what do we do with that? And so that was really what became of the first security operation centers, this first SOX, usually out of um, companies like EDS, IBM, companies that were trying to figure out how to outsource, uh, be an outsource provider for a lot of companies. That was a natural progression into what was the original managed security services businesses. Um, so a company called Riptech was the very first, as far as I know, MSSP in the world. Uh, they got bought by Symantec. And the model was basically, if you were a large bank or a large retailer, you would take your data and you'd ship it over to the MSSP. They would run it through really the original days of ML and AI, and then say, this looks like something bad's happening. They'd send alerts back. Yep. Um, and so it's a very arm's length relationship, uh, but it was a, a basically a more sophisticated second pair of eyes for a lot of these you know global 1000 companies. The interesting part is that model, believe it or not, is still essentially the same model in the MSSP world, which is insane considering that's been 20 plus years. Uh, and so you know, our view is that uh, there's a massive change coming to the MSSP space. Uh, obviously, SoulCyber is, uh, we are nominally in the space, uh, but we take a much more integrated approach. Our view is that running security programs is really where companies are sort of breaking down. Um, alert fatigue is a real problem. And so yeah. how do you provide more value to organizations uh, so that the limited security resources they have can be used on more high value and more intimate problems, right? So there are just certain things that are very hard to do remotely, like fraud detection um, or integrated DevSecOps. Those are have to be done most of the time by local employees. And so we're trying to offload this, the programmatic security components um, with the management, with the detection, with real response, so that they can um, move up into the up and you know up into the right inside the value chain. Yeah, it's it's interesting to have you describe that. Like I completely understand because it, it, you know if you look at the information uh, uh, management and collaboration space, it very much followed the exact same pattern. Um, one, I you know as I often chair, it's like the, you know, people don't think about security. They don't think about governance until there's a breach, until something happens. And then they're, and then they, you know, freak out. And at best you have something that happened to your partner or something within your industry that is a wake up call and gets people to go in there mm. and take steps to go in and lock things down, be secure. But it's interesting. Again, this is showing my age. Uh, um, a, a lot of the security measures were physical security. So the separation of data centers and access into those and how locked down those things were. I mean, I started my career at the beginning of the 90s and was doing data warehousing and data warehouse consolidation. And so a lot of that, we didn't have to worry about data being out of the internet. It took another 15, 20 years for a lot of those companies to trust the cloud to even start mm. moving. And this was mm. before, you know, SAS was an acronym out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there wasn't the cloud. It was just, we're going to directly connect and intentionally share something back and forth with these systems. And yet there were still issues. There were still hackers. There were still yep. problems around that. Yeah, and the, the thing is, is if you're a really, really large company, you think, you know, Fortune 10 Bank, you've got the resources. So this, this arm's length relationship where you consume alerts from a third party is, is sort of still fine. I mean, they've got thousands of people that can consume alerts and consume information. 
Um, but for anybody below them, even sophisticated companies are sort of struggling. And I think what you just talked about there is, is everyone's got to figure out how to use their resources in the best way possible. And as the data becomes more ubiquitous, um, they're starting to realize, especially in the advent of AI, they're just starting to say, where are my boundaries? Who's watching the boundaries? And am I uh, patrolling those in a consistent manner? And, and the example I use all the time is like, you know, every, every Friday, we all want to clean our house so that our house is clean on the weekend, right? So that's, that's our intent. But then somebody pings us and they have a happy hour. The kids have to go to a practice. You know, the wife needs to go um, set up something with the in-laws, whatever. And all of a sudden, the cleaning of the house never happens. And that's what we're consistently seeing in the security space is people know they need to run the program, but the program is this very repetitive, not really super sexy thing that is the security. It's the, it's the security is in the repetition. And so as organizations struggle to do that, um, we continue to see, you know, as they struggle, they continue to be problems, right? So if you think of the, the casino problems that we've had recently, you know, they've got the tools, they got the people, how is it still happening, right? Well, that's uh, so much of it is because uh, ex exactly right. I mean, there's the, the data is out there, but we're overwhelmed with data. And mm -hmm. so, so much uh, focus has been around the last couple of years, especially around automation. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a, a, so a lot of excitement around AI, but again, for these organizations, uh, they understand, Hey, we can go and automate these things. We need to do more with less, fewer people. That's always been the story Certainly my entire career, 30 plus years has been, we've never had enough people for the work that we're asked to go and do. Mm -hmm. um, but that's certainly true around um, the security side of things, being able to monitor all these things. The The rule of thumb for, uh, so I'm a information management governance guy. One of the things that we always try to do is push ownership of that as close down to the people that own the data, that own the documents, that know the business to be able to manage those things. But of course, you can't just throw the dashboard and all those alerts and have them monitor all those things and think it's going to be done in a, like you have to have guardrails. You you have to have like the structure, the automation to allow them to focus on those, you know, higher level deliverables mm -hmm. to focus on what the business actually needs, not get bogged down by following alerts, going and, you know, uh, um, putting out fires. That's right. That's right. 100%. Uh, and I think that's really what companies are struggling with right now is they're, they're trying to, they're, they're, they've got a traditional model that's in their head, which is this sort of like, I do everything and I ship some data off and I get some alerts, but I've got a limited number of people. It's not 24 by seven. Um, there's a set of skills that are needed across the entire security space these days. And you really have two options. Either you hire a bunch of people that have one or two of the skills. So you think, think, management, policy, um, you know, passive versus blocking systems, architecture, then you got to have forensics, you got to have analysis, you got to have the ability to do response, or you go find somebody who's very hard to find, but actually understands almost all those pieces. Yeah. And then you can get one or two, but then, you know, if they go on holiday, so, right. you know, what do you do? And so right. even in large companies, they, I'm like, why try to staff all those skill sets when you can get that in a model that is outsourced. And the reason is, is no one's doing it there. We're still sort of stuck in a very traditional model. It's like, um, I don't know, like, you know, a decade ago, I had thousands of Dell servers, right. And I had data centers all over the world and I had an infrastructure management team and we don't have any of that anymore. We have people that manage Azure and AWS. Right. Right. So this whole, like that whole layer has been up leveled to an outcome from the you know the the cloud providers and i just think that's going to have to happen more inside of information management inside of information security because it doesn't make sense like it makes zero sense for me to have an entire infrastructure management team when i can go and get an outcome base but that took like a decade for companies to sort of get comfortable with that because i, I think like, it well, took longer than that I, you know, my, so I, again my i was with a startup out of the bay area um back and joined in 2001 after selling my company was there for for about three years that was going and trying to convince people to do collaboration out on this dedicated cloud platform. So it was, it wasn't just a broad SaaS application. It was, we managed the servers and it was even more secure there, specific mm -hmm. companies and partners that within, within that. Uh, it took a long time to convince companies. I mean, I was on some of those initial sales calls 
for even companies that helped fund the startup that I was a member mm -hmm. of. And still they struggled with moving their data over into the cloud. Yep. Yep. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, talking with uh, so Jeff Teepers, the, the business of the productivity platforms, collaboration platforms at Microsoft, um, even he said that he, he said it was like 2015, 2016, where he said it felt like the majority had moved into like accepting the cloud, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. that my, I started in 2001 to his number of 2015, 2016. That's a long time to convince people to, to move across. And there's still a lot of on-prem. There are still yeah. a lot of Guns. hybrid where huge components you know, drive that. Now, do you work across companies of all sizes? Is it predominantly uh, SMBs? Yeah, so we work sort of in um, we we can we we have some very large very large customers, but we don't really spend a lot of time targeting hundred thousand seats, right? So, um, generally speaking, we're down into the five hundred seats. You know, we'll go up, you know, forty fifty thousand users, things like that. So, we have a pretty broad capability around users, but we are definitely not going after the global one hundreds. Um, so we're staying below that uh, because the model that we offer. I think it's just more interesting at the at the mid market space. Uh, and to your to your point, you know, one of the reasons why cloud adoption was so slow is everyone's like, well, what do I do with all these Dell servers and this infrastructure team I've built? And so, you know, we we work with a lot of companies that are in that process of either the growing. So it says it doesn't make sense to continue to try to build out this entire infrastructure and the security program, um, or uh, they've been doing it sort of, you know, not very professionally or sort of um, the investment level hasn't been high enough and they're looking to over, overhaul it um, and say, okay, we need something consistent, repeatable, scalable um, at a cost that that's manageable. It, so we win a lot of business there too. Is is there kind of a, uh, um, uh, you know, um, like a natural, uh, you know, areas that you can move over and kind of, I was going to use the phrase, like you know, dipping your toes in the water mm -hmm. with having an MSSP start to work with you to start handing over pieces of that. I mean, again, mm -hmm. coming from the collaboration space, the number one, the easiest place to do to move to the cloud. And it's always the first step is email, move that across first. It's the most mature services and things around mm -hmm. that to control while you still do everything else but slowly companies move across and more and more services handed over to these cloud services. Is there a kind of a similar path for security? There is. I, and mainly it's due to the perception of the underlying companies. So it's not, ironically, uh, some of the places that organizations start isn't necessarily where I'd say would be the most effective. And so if you think of the classic Pareto principle, like 80% of the problem um, versus 20% of the problem. You really need right. to focus on being really good at that 80%. And then you can go start turning a bunch of knobs to try to get that 20%. Right. Um, but we, we find some companies really get sort of enamored with the latest and greatest, you know, widget. And we're like, those are great. And they do solve this niche problem, but you really do have to run the basics of security really, really well. Uh, and so that comes down to, can you do very good endpoint response, like proper endpoint response? Can you quarantine machines, people, processes? Can you roll back, right? Um, do you have the visibility and the telemetry to tell when something bad's happening before something bad's happened? So mm -hmm. organizations break in, they don't necessarily drop malicious code immediately. It's not, everyone thinks that like, there's still people in a, in a underground bunker hacking away. That's not, they, they log in, right? So they log in, they uh, canvas the organization. They may just put in, the ability to, you know, drop or they may, but they may not put in malicious payload. So can you find that before anything bad happens, right? Half your infrastructure is infected with uh, droppers, but they haven't actually done anything malicious. Your EDRs aren't going to find that. And so what happens is, is people get very focused on a thing because it becomes um, known. Uh, and our point is like, there's a consistency of, of very well executed security that will get you 80% of the security. And so to answer your question there, we tend to focus on Good endpoint, good vulnerability, um, good good people training, excellent email security, and it, and very very good user behavioral analysis. And if you do those five or six things really well, uh, and then obviously the the basics, what we call the MFA, like the turn it on once and it makes a difference. Right. We help with, but that's not an ongoing operation. It's like turn it on. If you do those five or six things from a day to day operation standpoint, you can significantly increase your security, um, and and really get the biggest bang for your buck. 
Yeah. I, you know, I've always heard, uh, I, I don't have like the, the specific numbers, but uh, I mean, I just, I inherently understand it, that the, the cost, the impact to an SMB is like five to 10 times uh, the, you know, the, the amount, the damage, the, the cost for an SMB of getting a breach of that is higher than the, the enterprise. Cause generally the enterprises, they, they will, it won't be everything that the enterprise controls. And then they've got those systems and they've got a lot of the process that's in place to be able to go and minimize that, you know, that breach. You hear about all the, the, the big breaches, um, but you don't hear as much the stories of what happens to the small companies and it can be just devastating. It can oh, ruin so a company. number of them go out of business. Right. Like uh, I can't remember. I think it's 60% of, of small, medium businesses that get a breach go out of business. Yeah. It's really a, a staggering figure. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to really help them. The problem there with the SMBs is they, they still sort of view it as like, I'm not the one who's going to get in the car crash. Right. Yeah. So I don't know if I need the insurance or I'll just get the insurance that protects me if I hit somebody and pick back their car, but I'm not going to get the one that, you know, what is a collision and whatever the two are, but the one that, you know, gets my car back um, and fixed. And so um, you're starting to see that change slowly, but in the SMB space, you still see a lot of organizations that are like, you know, AV and a firewall is probably good enough. And I can tell you with absolute certainty that is not good enough. <laughs> yeah. It, um, yeah, I mean the the other thing that probably the two biggest um, areas to, that companies I, I think should be thinking about is is one um, the fact that um, even tiny little companies I, I'm a independent and yet I've got clients all over the world so thinking about it in a global context number one and then number two is the like is the uh, uh, the elephant in the room is specifically around AI. And how much more are we opening ourselves up to risk there? So maybe you could talk about both those points. Like, how do you address that from a, is there, are there differences whether I work in a state, in a country versus global around how you approach that with customers? Yeah, this is a really, really important question. And um, because we're, we've been, we've been doing it a long time in, in previous companies, because we're a relatively new company, we could set it up, um, under a model that we call identity first. And so whether smart or lucky, I'm not sure, but almost all the traditional models are very perim perimeter focused. It's this IP address at the perimeter. It makes it incredibly difficult to get that back to who the end user is and who the person is and what's actually happening with them. And then you add in the fact that hybrid is now a very consistent working model. So mm -hmm. most of the employees are working from home either all the time or most of the time. Now you have, where is your perimeter, right? And so our view is that you have to take an identity first model against everything that you do so that when there's something happening, we know it's Christian and we know that it's Christian's laptop and we don't really care if Christian's in, you know, Bangladesh or Boston, right? We can still see what's happening in a level of detail that we can see the problem and then Secondly, we can fix the problem, right? So we can actually do human-led response to solve that. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you haven't started with identity, you are really, really behind. Um, business email compromise, account takeovers, those, there's no malicious data on those things, right? Um, Identity-led logins, right? So somebody's logged in as Christian but isn't Christian. These are all the ways that the bad actors are getting into the organization and creating ha havoc. And, and if you're on this traditional perimeter-based model, you you have zero visibility and fidelity into those things. So um, we were lucky, I think, partly when we founded the company that we were correct in our prediction that identity was going to be the next battlefield. So everything we built has started around starting at the identity and working our way out. So that's, uh, I think, the first thing. Um, the second thing around AI, you've got two big problems there. The first one is um, what's called attacker in. The adversaries, the breakout time right now is around seven minutes. So the time that... Um, an organization uh, gets onto your network and then gets across the network. It's about seven minutes for them to get from your laptop or desktop over to the network. That is going to come down drastically. We are going to see that breakout time come down significantly. So mm -hmm. um, the second piece you're seeing is obviously AI exploits. So the ability to get onto your laptop um, or log in as you um, is going to be much more um, successful. Uh, so we've already seen AI being tested out against... Um, essentially finding zero days and things along those lines and having good success. So 
you're going to have more breaches and they're going to be faster uh, getting across the network and doing damage. So um, the good news is, you know, on the defense side, we know it, we sort of are aware of the problem. We're continuing to innovate. There's great tooling out there, obviously great service providers. So it's going to be the classic game there. But I think organizations do not under, especially again in the mid market, they do not understand how easy it is to get into a network, how easy it is to steal an MFA session and then really wreak some havoc. They, they still think, oh, I've got MFA turned on my phone. I'm good. I mean, it's just not the way it is. Yeah. You, you know, I've got, got a good friend who's a security expert, former Microsoft MVP, uh, uh, Liam Cleary. He used to do a session at conferences that I absolutely loved um, uh, called, uh, uh, so it's around, you know, come from the SharePoint background, but mm -hmm. so information systems saying, so you think you can hack SharePoint and basically mm -hmm. what he did and he's in the, uh, the Northern Virginia area. So he has a lot of government customers yeah. and stuff around there. We were doing a, a, a the conference and I've seen him do, do the session several times, but he was in DC and he would at the beginning of it say, look, everything I show you, um, it's perfectly legal. Um, he says, if I find a government site that's wide open, if I were to take a screenshot, I would be breaking the law. Mm -hmm. But let me let me show you this stuff. And he, he would specifically say, if while I'm looking around, because he would just go out on the internet and say, what do I see? Using mm -hmm. a bunch of tools that are open source that are available tools. And he would find the systems and he says, if you see your environment that you're like your division, your business, like do not say anything, come and talk to me afterwards. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, um, <laughs> again, so it, each time I saw him do the session, someone in the room gasped loud yeah. because yeah. it was their environment. And he would, like, I remember this one in DC when he got up, walked out of the room with the woman and had a conversation with her. I'm like, how, like, how'd that conversation go afterwards? And uh, and he said, I, like I, I told her, I said, look, I'm not, this is not a, I'm not one of these, I don't know what you call them, ethical hackers that just mm -hmm. goes and looks for holes and then walks in and says, pay me and I'll help you close that mm -hmm. hole. He doesn't do that, but he provided all of the, you know, the gu guidance, like, here's what you need to go and do. This is what I was able to go and do. Mm -hmm. But that was the mm -hmm. point is that most people are not aware of where they're wide open. And mm -hmm. from that opening what people can get access to. And right. usually it's everything. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. No, it's true. Um, I mean, do you it, guys it, do that kind of, you know, that is that even a thing still? The ethical, that is. was like 10 years ago, that was a big deal, but. Red teaming, you know, they're still out there. <coughs> um, we have partners that we work with. The, the, the reason is, is actually pretty logical, which is you don't really, well, our view is you don't really want your MSSP doing your red teaming, right? They should be, they should rel be relatively, it's like we, Generally speaking, you don't want your MSP doing your MSSP work because, you know, you want two sets of eyes and two sets of hands doing right. the separate jobs. Um, and so we can do it. And there's some really good red teaming uh, organizations out there um, that we partner with, but we always tell the customer, you know, you, probably, you can tell us that they're doing it or you can not tell us that we're doing it and we'll see if, you know, what happens. So um, that's one. To circle back real quick on your AI, the other big problem yeah. that I think organizations are struggling with is they don't know where the data is or they're being surprised at how much data they have in places that they didn't know they have. So as AI yeah, goes yeah. out and sort of vacuums up um, the data profiles and the data lakes, uh, they're sort of surprised at the boundaries or data boundaries. And this is probably where you spend a lot of time. That's exactly, that's my world. Yeah. That's the governance yeah. side of the of, of thing. Again, people don't realize, I get the argument a lot of saying, oh, we know we're secure. And yet these people are still finding this content they shouldn't have access to. It's like, know right. that you've just answered your own question like you are not as secure as you think you are that's right you that's you right. have uh, and and a lot of it goes back to like you're getting alerts we have these policies in place it should all be done i said yeah somewhere there are policies that conflict and the mm -hmm. system is defaulting the wrong way that's right um and so that's just something else you need to go and look in i mean it should be i mean I, and this is coming from a collaboration guy. Like I understand the security side of things, but show me a like a a, a highly secure lockdown collaboration environment, and I'll show you a collaboration environment that nobody uses. Yeah, exactly. Of course, right. So you've got to find that balance. Um, right. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I think you know. Again, this is why we constantly talk to customers, saying it is very hard to do data security and data boundaries as a consistent, repeatable function from a third party. So we mm -hmm. keep telling them, have your, quit having your people try to manage an endpoint tool, <laughs> which is not the best use of their time. You can do that really, we can do it. I, 
nine out of 10 people we talk to, we can do it way better than they are. Every now and then maybe there's a like super smart. And then have them go work on data boundary and data classification or data security or these things that you really actually need this intimate knowledge of the company and what you're trying to accomplish and how does that apply to policies and governance. That's a great use of security uh, folks time. But yeah. depending on the, the viewpoint of the overall organization, ironically, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get them to transition from this sort of repeatable run rate operation to the more what I think are the more valuable um, security activities they could be doing. Yeah, it, there. You're right that there are very few companies that understand the differences in that role. I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, years ago, I did a bunch of projects with Cisco, and they had a a, 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 a the proper view of like their very senior business analysts that understood both the technology, understood the business systems of that, and so they were going through and saying, okay, you're here's the PMs executing on these projects in IT and across the business. Here's the various vendors that are that are out there and the security team, that aspect of it. We're just making sure that, you know, we're the translator in between each of these different groups to make sure that, if, if okay, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing this pattern. We're seeing this behavior. Here's why. Here's what's actually happening on the business side that's opening up this hole that we need to go and mm -hmm. fill. And it needs to be done in a way that doesn't disturb, lets the business do this, that aspect. Okay. So having people with that, role that function those can't be outside people i mean they can be right. very expensive consultants but i'd say you want that knowledge you want that team internally that that's has right. that business knowledge that level that's right that's exactly it and and so i think we're going to continue to see success as organizations sort of rationalize the fact that ongoing security operations that can be 24 by 7 that needs to be 24 by 7 that can be outsourced the, the repeatable the things that are, as I say, the least sexy things on the planet, but that have to be done really, really well, you know, the cleaning your house, I would not view that as a high value activity on my side, but it's better than stepping on a toy and, you know, you know, breaking a leg. And so it's the same thing. It's like these, these, these high value tasks should be internally led these 80% um, of your security that is repeatable and has to be done consistently and at a very high level of skill that should be outsourced. And I think as companies sort of understand those two pieces, they're going to use their resources in a much more uh, impactful manner. What do you typically see with new clients of like to get them onboarded and moving forward? Like, what does that process look like? What is that like discovery, the analysis, of their systems, you know, what, what do you target first? I'm just thinking of like for an organization that's thinking, oh, well, okay, we, we understand, like you've sold me on the idea of that. We need mm -hmm. to have partners that own this and are driving this. What does that process look like moving forward with an MSSB? The, we have a consistent onboarding process, as you can imagine, that mm -hmm. most, probably 80% of the companies are like, yeah, that makes total sense. Let's just follow that, that process. And the process is the biggest bang for your buck in the least amount of time is the things that we deploy first, right? So um, really high-end EDR capabilities is, all, is almost always where we start because that then allows our people to start solving problems. So if day one, we say, we're going to roll this solution out. Day two, we have the ability to go, oh, there's something bad on 20 of these machines or 20% that we can actually start fixing. So second piece then is what we call um, high value win. So this could be advanced email capability. So really high end advanced email that's looking for BECs and ATOs, relatively simple to do an MX record change, things like that. And so, you know, as you get down into like DNS security and some of the more um, really needed capabilities. So think about it. Like back in the day, we all sat in the office, right? We had desktops and we went home, we didn't work. So everything went through the firewalls and you could sort of create the visibility of the network and you could take the data from there. But if you're working out of the house, how do I know? And you're logged into your own email system and all of a sudden you're going outbound to a, a malicious URL, right? There's literally zero telemetry. So you have to have DNS security and other types of things on the laptops. Those can, those can be a little bit more um, they take a little bit longer to deploy and get ready. And so those tend mm -hmm. to be a little bit later. Um, Identity-based UEBA, we get on as quickly as possible because we want to try to get visibility into the behavioral analytics so that if there's um, non-malicious activity being done that is nefarious, again, we can get eyeballs on that and say, okay, by the way, it looks like Scott's identity is not is being used by somebody besides scott but so far nothing he hasn't they, they the attacker hasn't done anything yet so we sort of walk through 
and when we having done it enough, we're like, okay, we can get this done fast, and this provides a lot of value. This get, this provides a lot of value, but it takes longer, so we're going to put that sort of towards the back. And so that's really it's an we call ourselves eminently practical is the term that we use, uh, and that's sort of the way we do onboarding. And that can be we've been fully deployed in like seven days, and sometimes it takes you know for larger customers maybe it takes you know sixty days. Yeah, uh, you know it. it it's, I mean, there was this huge push again, what was it like a decade ago? I know time is, doesn't have uh, the same meaning that it used to, uh, how many years back it, it was, but there was a big push towards, um, you know, away from managed devices. It was that you'll know, bring your own device and work from mm -hmm. anywhere and all those kinds of yep. things. And it, a lot of the security was done. Of course you have like a lot of organizations now are kind of stepping back saying, no, we're enforcing multi-factor authentication and you know, other mm -hmm. things around that, but you still have a lot more risks. Like this is my personal workstation that I'm running this off of as a consultant working with multiple clients, you know, like I, I don't have a managed device. I mean, I, mm -hmm. there's certain, I, one of my clients is a German company. It's very security minded. I had to, my system had to be you know, up to a uh, par with the standards to be able to en enforce for their, for their mm -hmm. rules. But then I'm also locked out of most of their systems yep. because I'm a remote employee. Yep. But do you see us, are, are organizations moving back away from the, any device, anywhere, anyone, are they pushing back on that back to where, because again, I go back to my data center days, my phone company days where I had a, uh, I had two mobile phones. Uh, mm -hmm. so I had the personal and I had my work one, I mm -hmm. had my work laptop and a fully managed device. Yep. I had a, uh, uh, you know, I had the, uh, what is it? What was it even called? I had the little card with the serial numbers instead of MFA, but it was the RSA, highly secure, RSA token. the little pin card thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, that it would carry it around, uh, you know, everywhere. If people don't know what I'm talking about, it's, it was, it was almost like a really super thin calculator type thing. And but it would serialize that just like, you know, MFA. Yep. Um, but I had, you know, all of that because I was going into secure locations. And even mm -hmm. then there were people that guards with guns at the door, you know, yep. uh, facilities. Man traps. Uh, right. Um, and, biometric and, man traps. And all of that. But I'll, I'll tell you, it was a wonderful place in the Sacramento Valley in the summer going to the data centers and uh, how you know, air conditioned and it, it, was, it was fantastic working at data centers during the summers there. <laughs> no, but so do you see companies kind of moving back away from that movement? I think BYOD is definitely not um, on the up, upswing. I mean, again, we spend a lot of time in the mid-market and m organizations are giving out laptops. They're like, hey, this is your, this is your work laptop. We're going to fully manage this thing because it has to be at a level of security. Um, that makes sense to the company candidly even there most of the time it's under secured relative to what we think is like the bare minimum and we're not being crazy about it i mean if I, if you were a government entity we would be significantly past um what we're offering on the commercial space uh, but even there uh, we are seeing companies generally speaking uh, offer managed devices to the employees and not saying bring your own laptop anymore yeah i i, I again I, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, more phones you know, I mean, MDM is growing as a category. Mm -hmm. I mean, I work pri predominantly in the Microsoft ecosystem. I mean, that space is growing as more uh, more organizations, again, become very aware of that. And it goes back to this idea that we we want to spend our time on business activities and not thinking about these other pieces. Yep. Well, if you have those guardrails in place, if you have these managed devices in place, it allows you then to... It's like, okay, I understand the constraints of this network that I have to work within, mm -hmm. but then let me add it. I can go do whatever I need having met those standards, company right. device, company phone, multi-factor authentication, I'm in, get my work done. That's right. And that's it. And that's really what we're trying to get companies to do is to have that base. We call it foundational, right? Just have that foundational level of security, <clears throat> both from a setup, obviously MFA, SSO done the right way, and then from a consistent operational standpoint, the stuff that, you know, that sends off the alarm bells that looks at all the, at the fires that are starting that sees if people are knocking on the doors and, and have that done. And in combination, you can really get a lot of security in place pretty quickly. Yeah. Oh, I love the, 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 uh, the caveat, the phrase, you know, if done the right way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so uh, I don't know if like we run into it constantly. We're, we're at a point where about, um, 
50% of the customers we talk to don't even have all the entitlements turned on that they purchased. Yeah. Um, over 80% of them aren't depl fully deployed. So we'll, they'll, they'll plot something. They're only like 70% deployed. So you got 30% of your infrastructure that's uncovered. Um, most of the organizations are in passive uh, uh, policies versus blocking policies. So, so when I say the right way, it actually is like people, people still think, well, I bought this tool. And then they get breached. Like, well, how the heck did I get breached? I bought this best in class tool. It's very expensive. Oh, oops. Policies was incorrect. Wasn't deployed to your entire infrastructure. Um, and nobody, so therefore nobody saw anything. Right. Well, that's the mistake that companies, again, working with a Microsoft 365. Well, Microsoft was compliant to all these standards and build it. Yeah. yeah, but that was the platform. As soon as yeah. you touch it, like yes. you've broken everything. Like you need to ensure that your data, your system, your people are secure within that it has nothing to do with the security level of the software that was developed that you're now using yeah. um, through the cloud. And we had, we had a, we had a product meeting uh, last week and our CTO <clears throat> who's uh, and, and our head of product are very, incredibly smart guys when it comes technical. And he made the joke, you know, sometimes I think our true value add is just pestering the crap out of our customers to make sure they're doing the right, doing the right thing. Yeah. And I said, you know, there's something to that. Like, you know, my accountant, when tax time comes says, Scott, taxes are, you know, the taxes are due. You got to start gathering all your documents. Like, oh crap. Yeah. I got to go do that. Right. Yeah. I, I, so, you know, there's something to, um, having somebody keep reminding you that you need to, you need to do these things. Well, that is a key to, we'll get into more of the, like the cultural uh, aspects of change management. And I'm mean, like, I've had multiple experiences of leading, uh, uh, you know, I used to build PMOs and, and leading project and engineering teams at a couple different companies, including Microsoft. And uh, part of that was in operations is that we'd notice that because we'd see the traffic that, people are not looking at their dashboards. They're not looking at the metrics. No one's opening these reports that are being emailed out mm -hmm. weekly around this. And mm -hmm. so we we went in and we said, okay, what, what are we missing here? We And we changed things up. It didn't change what we were doing. Yeah. It We just, I would say spoon feeds the wrong way to, to do it, but we had to nurture people into yes. um you know, uh, uh, changing the way that they're working to con consume this information we were providing. And then we started getting all these uh, kudos and, and got uh, awards and in, in company for, uh, you know, building all these tools and things. And, you know, the, the team, we're all just kind of doing the side eye to each other. Like, yeah, we didn't change anything that we're actually doing except the display that you see. Mm -hmm. And we went on this almost marketing, you know, um, strategy to right. get people to go and adopt that thing but but that's why you know adoption strategies need to be part of any security change and rollout if you're going to change mm -hmm. process which will mess with how people are working today you know, people don't change readily mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it takes time you have to be patient you have to also recognize I mean, that's why when I consult with a company, a big part of it is that discovery process, understanding the, you know, the, 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 the appetite for change uh, within an organization. What is the culturally, how do they work? Because um, yeah. otherwise you deploy this, you put all these tools in place, they hired new people, then those people aren't supported because there was never really support from the top down. They didn't mm -hmm. make any cultural changes, uh, you know, and Yeah. It's, it's a, I did a very, had a very large customer years ago that I went in and helped with doing a, uh, um, around there, they were um, getting uh, fined for improper process around customer credit card information. Mm. Very important thing. And it was mm -hmm. thousands of dollars a day in growing that they were getting penalized. And so to go help make the change. Part of it, while we went through all the training and uh, all this this process change and made sure we we met the standards for that, um, I was then brought back in a couple times to do spot checks, mm -hmm. and they actually fired people on the spot that right. a week later were found going back to the old way and writing mm -hmm. customer information on a sticky, leaving it on their desk, things stupid things like that. But yeah. and again, that's an extreme case. Right. But again, change is hard. It takes time. Like that seems like it would be an important aspect of it's, it's any service down. offering. We um we just we just won a customer recently, and the what they had good tooling, but the people that they 
so imagine that you buy the tool, then the, the vendor trains you on the tool, right? So now you have two or three people trained on the tool. Then those two or three people leave. And so now you have no way to run the tool. So then you go try to hire the people and you, it's tough to hire the people. And so it goes to this whole thing where culturally, again, it's not necessarily about the tool. There's amazing tools out there. And really you do actually have to have good tools. But the bigger problem is, is this operational piece. As you said, it's the change management. It's the executive sponsorship. It's the culture of if we buy the thing, you know, it doesn't make a bunch of sense to go buy, you know, a high, you know, uh, expensive vehicle and then never take it in for service, right? Yeah. Or, you know, so you, you buy your Porsche or your whatever, and then you never service the thing or you service it once and then you don't do it because, and that's, that's this consistent place that these companies are in. Yeah. And so to your, to your point, this cultural, there has to be a cultural mind uh, change, a mind shift around how to do security. And it's got to be shifting from, what is the latest and greatest widget? You're going to have to get that anyway. To how do we run the program consistently and then using whichever widgets make sense? Yeah. And I think if that culture changes, then organizations are in a better spot because they're not in this constantly on the back foot because you know their head of security left who, had, who was the only person that knew where all the bodies were buried and right. the only person that knew which widgets were turned on and turned off. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny, but one of my earliest jobs when I joined the phone company was... Um, there was a gentleman who was retiring 30 year at, at the the phone company. And um, it's one of those where he had like the, the little um, 850 square foot bungalow in Palo Alto that he bought in 1974 that he was selling yeah. for like $2 million or something. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> anyway, it was so nice retirement um, and they were moving out of state, but uh, no, uh, you know, a big part of that, uh, you know, process is um, one, uh, you know, going in and assessing, where, where things are, um, understanding, okay, what, what is the path that's going to take this? I mean, this is a fundamental change management consultant project. What is the baseline? Where are you today? Where do you want to be? Where do you need to be? And then mm -hmm. that process to get from A to B, you know, that could be very short. That could be very long, right. um, depending on the response and the players that are in place there. But, that's right. um, but a big part of that, that job with the phone company was, um, the taking his documented process and it was literally in a three ring binder. He had everything mm -hmm. doc. He had spent months documenting everything that he did. So here he was retiring and I'm the new hire and I got hold of the binder and I'd go and ask a question. And he's like, it's in the binder. And I go spend an hour digging through trying to find, I'm like, I don't find what you're talking about. And he would come back over and he said, it's here right here, this workflow. And as he's walking me through it, He's adding all these things that weren't in the workflow yeah, and I'm writing yeah, notes in the margins around yeah. this thing of this process that I'm, that I'm taking over. And, and, and so again, you, you, it, 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 he, he had a lot of tribal knowledge, right? The, a lot He's of the like, tribal, he, that institutional yeah. knowledge that it doesn't yeah. easily move across. That is also something that you need to think a lot about. It's one of the reasons I got into information management was mm -hmm. because I was doing engineering management, project management. And I got into the documentation side of this and the lack thereof right. and helping these organizations do that. And so I kind of found my way into information management systems. And it was the classification. It was the searchability, findability of that, mm -hmm. that information all had to be part of that strategy to make sure the rest of those, that operations team was up and running. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing, Christian, out there when it comes to so classification was a massive push, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Then it sort of died off a little bit as people were struggling to maintain the classification inside of an yeah. organization as people weren't classifying properly. You know, if you look at like government, uh, you know, CUI, classify, uh, um, uh, unclassified information, um, confidential unclassified information, it's everywhere because the government just says they, they just click Classify yes everything. on everything, well, right? Right. And, yeah. And so in the commercial space, I just saw data classification really sort of fail unless you're in a very specific type of company. Um, and organizations are, you know, sort of pivoted to the DLP and those types, but those are very noisy. So what are you, what yeah. are you seeing out there as far as like, is data classification coming back? Is AI going to help with that? Or is it going to be more enclave still driven? This is our enclave. Anything in here is, is, has a set of rights and responsibilities. Well, certainly there are industry specific, you know, requirements yeah, right. around a lot of that. And it, it, um, I'm look, there more are, broadly, not, and there not, are not small, like a global 100 billion. Right. 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 And uh, I mean, there are small organizations that can have very complex requirements and collaboration needs for that. 
Um, so I, I, I think it is a, a mistake that's being made is thinking that we'll plug in AI and it will go and figure all this stuff out yeah, and yeah. spit it back. It's like, no, there's still readiness for AI. You mm -hmm. still need to go in and uh, and do the classification to organize that data and do the, and and proactively your permissions management around the various systems and tools, uh, because otherwise uh, uh, the AI tools will go and start surfacing data that people shouldn't have access to. It's okay. the same as as search technology got more and more advanced over the years. We'd hear from clients all the time that would be like, "Hey, search is broken." And we're like, "Well, what are you seeing? Well, these people shouldn't have access to that." I get. No, mm -hmm. search is working better yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's you can no longer security through uh, obscurity is not a strategy. Okay. You have to be proactive, and it's I think as we started this conversation, it's not a matter of if you're going to be breached; it's when and how mm -hmm. much can you mitigate the risks around that. So okay. by understanding what data you have, by having the guardrails in place, so that you don't have to worry about if if I go and start like I work in Microsoft Teams. If I go and create a Microsoft Team, I'm working on it actively for three months. Then after that, the project is closed. I never do anything with it. If the guardrails are in place, so that the system knows that if I leave the company. It doesn't just float out there as an ownerless, uh, ownerless site or team with users and content, you know, intellectual property that's on that. It automatically gets assigned ownership to my manager, or IT takes it and they find the individual to own that thing. That right. after thirty days or sixty days of no use on that team, that it automatically archives. That it like you take all those steps. Yeah. That's why automation is such a big part of it. And this goes back to what you said at the beginning too, is it's because of, you know, 80% of what people are doing, like it's a no brainer. If there's a site that's done, it either needs to be deleted or archived. You can automate that either way, mm -hmm. have it so that if after 90 days of inactivity, it notifies the multiple owners, if no one responds or if they respond saying don't need this anymore and we've already have a process of classifying the data. If I've classified the data, so yep. it automatically takes those steps. Yep. As a user, I don't need to think about, okay, where does this need to go? It's built in. So then I can focus my time on the 20% of the special projects that that's are right. complicated and messy every time. That's right. And let and that's everything what basically, else We're in the same boat, we're, which is what we're telling, we're telling companies to do that. I mean, to your point, I think we're at around 40 to 50% of companies we talk to, their Active Directory and their SIM deployments are literally baseline. Nothing, like, and they haven't, they literally installed it and left it. And they've yeah. got, they've got accounts everywhere, service accounts everywhere. We do an, an Active Directory assessment for organizations because and we do it on a continual basis. So every six yeah. months we do an Active Directory assessment for them. Right. Um, we don't run Active Directory for them, but we know that they're not doing the house cleaning that's needed in order to have it be secured um, or at least more secure. Right. And so we force them <laughs> through the process, right? Well, which is, so I look at that and I say, well, well, they are doing what they should to be by hiring you to do that for them. So I mean, that is become well, their process. Yeah, if, so, if they yeah. do, but we're saying right. that when we meet them, they're not doing anything. Right. Yeah. Well, the, and that that's the thing is to be, to go in and say that like, look, you don't need to do this. I think that's the point of hire consultants, hire a vendor to come in and run those things, which, should be running automated in the background. You don't understand how to do it, but like you can be compliant. You can hit these standards. You can make yep. sure that you're reducing your risk by farming some of this out. This is what it actually looks like. Especially stuff you're not good at and you don't like. Right. I mean, I like cooking, so I'm not going to farm up. I'm not going to get a chef if I had the money to, but you know, I wouldn't, but I don't really like cleaning. So I don't want to get a cleaner. Like you have right. to pick these things that as an organization, you want to spend your time on and the stuff that you're not, that needs to be done. You got to figure out a way to get that covered. That's really like I, what the, the future is. It's funny to say this again, at, you know, the, the category of SAS, which is really like the late nineties when it was, I remember when the term actually came across, but mm -hmm. you know, it was part of the whole, the, the dot com bubble, all, all these SAS companies out there, but that's really what we're moving toward. The whole move to the cloud was move to the okay. SAS model is divest, move away from the things which are not central to your business. That's right let people yep. run the systems and then operate within that. Like my right. data is more secure sitting in your environment with your vendor, with all of this, the, the, the standards, all of the rules, all, all of the, 
uh, I mean, again, if you abuse that, if you did something or lost the data, like how quick I could just sue you and you know, right. yeah. cover that. But then allow me to go and focus on, you know, what is actually going to drive and build my business. It, it's, it's not running and managing servers. We had this debate when we started the company on legal. And I said, we are not a legal company. Right. And so we, at a very high level, we have three different types of legal. We have contract, we have uh, IP, uh, and then we have like um, governance. And we were like, we're just going to go get three companies that do, that specialize in those three things. And wherever we need them, we literally, right. and so we, we keep explaining companies like, we don't do it for legal. We don't do it for, you know, infrastructure outsourcing. Why are you trying to, why are you trying to be a security program company? Right. It, it makes zero sense, but it's because the model's always been there. You know, up until 10 years, you went out and you hired a legal person, right? You had your own HR person, right? All that stuff is being outsourced into SaaS-based type models. I think more and more, uh, you know, smaller companies, startups certainly that are, that understand, hey, we're not core to this. We can go and purchase these services when we're ready, when we can afford them mm -hmm. to bring it on, which allows us to grow much more quickly by not having to go and hire a, a, a legal team to hire these different pieces that you can, uh, uh, you know, easily go and get services around. That's right. So That's that, right. that the future is SaaS. It is. It is. Yeah. And we and by, we sell our stuff literally per user per month. Yeah. And it's it's sort of everything is built in there. So. Well, um, Scott, really appreciate your time. I've enjoyed the conversation. It's it's uh, uh I mean, I've I've known I know a lot of people in the security space, the, the, the parallels, but with the collaboration space. But uh, I mean, really, you can't separate them. It's their mm -hmm. essential pieces. Uh, that's right. To the same puzzle. So, well, Scott, really appreciate your time. Of course, I'll provide the links all to uh, to Scott to Soul Cybers, uh, all of the social links and things that are out there. Please go take a look if you're interested in following up or asking any other questions based on what we talked about. But I'm easy to find, Scott at soulcyber.com. So, uh, Christian, I really appreciate the time. Thanks for your time. Cheers. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening. Thank you.